we can start now. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, Dr. Mu'taz. Uh, we're happy that you are uh, joining this uh, conference. Uh, let me uh, quickly introduce Dr. Mu'taz. Uh, Professor Mu'taz Atallah uh, holds a chair in the Advanced Materials Processing at the School of uh, Metallurgy and Materials University uh, of Nottingham, uh, of Birmingham. Uh, he's a professor of Advanced Material Processing. Um, his research focuses on developing uh, a metallurgical understanding of the material process interaction in additive manufacturing of metallic materials, focusing on the process impact on the microstructure and the uh, structural integrity development. Uh, his research also is conducted through research partnerships with various companies in the aerospace, defense, medical space, and nuclear energy sectors. He co-authored over 150 journal and conference papers and three book chapters, and uh, he's a co-inventor on eight patent applications. Welcome, Dr. Martaz. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, it gives so much pleasure to, uh, to be present with you today. This is, by the way, my um, third time to be giving a talk in a Nile University event. Um, I've been a, a long keen supporter of the, um, of the university since the time of uh, my late friend, Professor Mustafa Ghanem, Allah um, This is um, a great initiative that you're doing in Egypt and I'm very keen always to support you uh, in your uh, future activities. Today I'll be talking about additive manufacturing of smart and magnetic materials. This is the uh, number of studies, um, like uh, um, snapshots of the different acti activities we've been doing in this field um, uh, at, at the University of Birmingham. I'll start by giving just a brief introduction about my research group, AMPLAB, um, the lab is, of course, a manufacturing lab, so we focus on a number of technologies. One of them is um, additive manufacturing, of course, and using specifically a technology known as selective laser melting. If you don't know about additive manufacturing, selective laser melting in, in, is one of those techniques, or sometimes it's called laser powder bed. It uses thin layers of powders that are melted and fused sequentially through the action of a laser that scans a 2D layer. And then when a layer is finished, you add more powders and then the laser would come in to melt the subsequent layer. So the part will be built from the bottom to the top. Um, this, is a, uh, this process um, can usually put up to around 100 gram per hour of material, um, for instance, from titanium alloys. This machine is like the one we have in Birmingham, which has four lasers. So that can speed and quadruple the speed of production uh, of the process. We also use another technique known as direct laser deposition. And in that technique, a laser comes in to melt a layer. Uh, but this time, the layer, the powder is being sprayed from a nozzle. And uh, where the powder meets the laser, the part is printed this way. The technique itself is, is um, able to put much more material compared with the conventional um, uh, laser selective laser, compared with SLM. Uh, but at the same time, the tolerances and the resolution is not as good as what we typically get from uh, uh, selective laser melting. We also do a lot of work on powder technologies. So we use powder metallurgy or powder hipping as people sometimes may know it. Uh, this is a process where you use a pressurized furnace to force powder particles to consolidate and join up together so that you can use it to create net shapes of different alloys, like nickel alloys, titanium alloys, and steels. Um, we also do a lot of work on alloy development, and in our approach of materials development, we also rely on a laser-based technique. In, in this process, we use uh, elemental wires, wires made out of different elements, for instance, let's say titanium and aluminum, and then these uh, wires, when they are, uh, they are put inside a special nozzle, and inside that special nozzle, they get melted through the action of a laser, like what you can see in the video. Um, the process is high throughput, so you can make new alloy chemistries very quickly. And at the same time, uh, it differs from, uh, for instance, other techniques in the ability to change the chemistry throughout where, uh, the, the shaping of the sample. So you can even look into this technique to create functionally graded materials. We also do a lot of work on ceramic splinting. So this is through a, a technique called DLP, or digital light processing. Um, so DLP uses ceramic slurry that then gets, it's a photosensitive ceramic slurry that gets 
cured through the action of the laser uh, of a UV light. And then after that, it gets debined and sintered to give us an edge shape similar to the one you see in front of you. So this is an overall cocktail of what we do in, in, in AMPLAB. The, uh, uh, what we can see is that the, the group itself in the current projects, we work on a number of, of sectors. We do a lot of work on 3D printing for the aerospace looking into a multiple of alloys that are typically applied in aerospace field. So these shapes you see in front of you are printed and, and it's, it's obviously you can generate structures without tooling in a very rapid way. Um, we do a lot of projects in the space sector as well. So looking into printing of space hardware, especially the hardware that can see significant temperature changes. So through working with the European Space Agency, we have been working on alloys that have low coefficient of thermal expansion, low, low CTE materials, so that they don't expand and contract violently when they see major temperature changes. We've also been looking into printing of thrusters made out of niobium alloys, small thrusters. They have been uh, investigated through a multiple of projects uh, with the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency. Um, we do all the projects on materials development, and one of the things we've been looking for is the generation of functionally graded materials. These are materials that have the ability to uh, change the chemistry from the bottom to the top. So you start from one alloy chemistry and you jump all the way to higher chemistry from one end to the other. This is through a 3D printing or additive metallurgy, additive manufacturing based technique. Uh, I'll be talking today also about some of the work we've been doing in the medical field, mainly on printing of stents and also printing of titanium alloys in, with low modulus, whether it's an alloy itself or the shape itself. I'll talk about that in details. And then printing of magnetic materials. So I've been printing um, soft magnets and magnetocaloric materials and magnetic smart materials. And that will be the scope again of, of my talk today. And then ceramics, printing of ceramics, as I, as I mentioned uh, uh, in the previous slide. And then last but not least, been doing a lot of work on printing of precious metals, printing of materials like gold, platinum, uh, palladium. These are very expensive materials, but they have significant applications in the high temperature sector. I mean, platinum is very expensive, as you know, it's, uh, it's almost um, 1 million Egyptian pound per kilogram. So uh, you have to be careful how you manufacture components with it. And 3D printing gives that ability to control the material quality uh, as you are printing it. Um, the process I'm going to be basing most of my talk today is, is SLM or selective laser melting, which sometimes may look like printing manufacturing by chaos. I hope you can see the video with some good level of clarity. Uh, this is what happens when the laser hits the powder inside the powder bed. It looks pretty chaotic. chaotic. You can see how the powders are flying, there is the spatter going up, things going down, surface tension pulling powder particles together evaporation of elements and things flying like it, it looks like a uh, some sort of like an explosive process to to actually to be to be using but despite everything the process works you can see you can see from the parts we make that despite all of these uh, irregularities you see and all of these uh, complex phenomena that you observe that you can still get a very good part made out of it 3d printing has moved a lot in the in the recent years and and in, in most of the talk these days in 3D printing, people actually stopped or they talk about 3D printing, but there is a lot of talk now about the so-called 4D printing. This is the, the, the high cycle for new technologies where um, every year um, Gartner, um, they publish a report on the future of new technologies. And they say that technology is split into five different stages. There's the innovation trigger, and then the technology will start. And then there is the peak of inflated expectations where everyone has a lot of expectations for a new technology. And then the trough of disillusionment when people somehow they lose faith in some of the new technologies. And then eventually you move into the so-called slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity where we start to see a productive technology. At that time in 2018, 4D printing was there. It was seen as a new idea that might change the way that we uh, make many manufacture many uh, smart and magnetic materials, which is what I'm going to talk about. But you can see here also some materials, like for instance, nanotubes, where at that time, at the peak in 2018, you find things like digital twins, again, was at the, at the, at the peak. Um, and then you find things like exoskeletons still as an innovation trigger. All of these type of uh, cycles are very helpful to, to give people who are working in a certain field uh, perspective about 
where things are heading in the future. Um, the concept of 4D printing is that you are using a technique like 3D printing to generate a structure that will respond to an external stimulus. So 3D printing means that we print things which are static. They are stable in their place in X, Y, Z. However, if you want something that is going to respond to a stimulus, then that moves us into the so-called 4D, 4D printing, which is the third, the, the time, time dependent functionality. Now, the, this is the simplest, probably the simplest shape of a 4D printed shape. This is a, an example of, an, of a door locking mechanism where in this case, if you apply uh, a load, the latch will move in. So that will cause the, 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 the door to open essentially. And uh, this is a response to load. There are other applications that people have been looking into to generate 4D printed structures. So one of them, for instance, was using uh, smart polymers to generate structures that will respond that will respond to temperature. So this is an example of an Eiffel Tower 3D printed. If you expose it to temperature, it will start to straighten up, as you can see, like that. And then, um, yeah, that's based on a, on a temperature as a stimulus. In this case, you will see also the the next one where they have a, a multi-material polymeric again gripper. So once it starts to, starts to hit a, a hot screw, it will be able to hold and flow into it, and then you can carry it this way. So again, a 3D printing or a 4D printed structure, 3D printed is, is static, X, Y, Z, you want something. I think the next slide has a very nice way of representing it. So 3D printing, you get the material, you print it, and then you have a static structure. This is meant to be a load bearing structure. If you want something which goes a little bit beyond the load bearing, then you may want either a smart material involved, you want a smart static structure, and then you want a stimulus somewhere, you want a mechanism of interaction, Obviously, you need a printer to print it. And then you need some mathematical modeling to be able to understand what this shape is going to do when you start moving it. So that's the difference. And this is actually was the, was the reason why many people, including myself, started moving into printing of um, magnetic, uh, magnetic and, smart material, and smart materials because of their ability um, to respond to stimuli and to see how we can get more applications out of them. Today, I'll be talking about some of our work in this field, but just to give you an idea about some of the structures that aren't necessarily static structures, they are meant to give us some sort of a, a functionality. So we've been printing, as I showed you, structures that can take, that are not necessarily static, but in that case, they are meant to take and uh, accommodate for expansion. These are made out of these low coefficient thermal expansion materials. There are structures that are meant to provide reactions and promote re chemical reactions. So this is an example of a catalyst bed where you generate a structure with a high surface area to volume to facilitate a chemical reaction. We've done a lot of work on structures that can be used to improve heat transfer. One of them is a structure called the heat pipe where you generate a, a structure with a lot of small fins inside these. Each one of them is around 80 microns. This is in order to generate a low, a high surface area to volume structure so that you can promote convection and, and heat transfer uh, in this way. Um, we've also been printing um, radio frequency devices. These are microwave uh, guides or resonators. So those of you who work on uh, uh, in this field may recognize the shape. We actually published almost uh, 10 papers about this work in IEEE journals. So uh, you, I hope some of you may find it interesting as well. Um, We've also been doing implants by 3D printing, but they are not 3D, they are not simply static implants. These are medical implants that contain cavities inside. And these cavities are used to leak drugs as the person, you know, as the, um, from inside the human body directly. So you make an implant, you fill it with an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory or a, a vaccine or something like that. And then the, it will start leaking over a certain period of time inside the body rather than taking it through the oral Route and then it goes to the digestive tract. So you take it straight into the into the bloodstream. Um, we've been printing also high temperature materials which are applied in collimation of X-rays. So again, X-ray collimators made out of tungsten, they don't really need uh, loads. They only need to focus the X-rays in certain directions. And something like 3D printing comes quite handy to do that. And then. We've done some work on magnetic shielding. I'm going to talk about that in more details. And then finally on 
sheet memory alloys. So let's begin now after this long introduction. So I will start by talking about 3D printing for quantum sensors. We have a large uh, program running at Birmingham looking into the manufacturing of mag uh, gravity sensors or quantum sensors as they we call them. Quantum sensors typically they rely on a technology called the cold atom technology where you use lasers to cool the matter down. And when you cool the matter down, basically you get the atoms to move very, very, or you get the atoms to move less. And this is the cold atom cloud concept. And when you are in that condition, you become more sensitive to magnetic fields. So, or, or more specifically, sorry, gravity fields. So if you put this sensor on a satellite, you'll be able to find where there is uranium maybe in Chile, there is some oil in Canada, there is some, tungsten in another place, there is gold. So you can find by small radio fluctuations in gravity, the locations of uh, heavier or certain features under the ground. The problem is that this structure itself can interact and it can be affected by magnetic shields, by magnetic fields. And, and this is how a quantum sensor looks like. It looks like a mechano set put together, a lot of parts, a lot of com small components co fitted together. So one of the main problems we want to do is to be able to protect it from any external magnetic fields. And because of that, we rely on those magnetic shields that we have been making. Magnetic shields, essentially, they are structures that will pull all the magnetic fields. So imagine you have, for instance, a copper wire. Copper wire would be the equivalent of high electrical conductivity. You want, in this context, something of a high magnetic permeability, something that would, magnetic fields would prefer to pass through compared with a material that has low magnetic permeability. So it will suck all the magnetic fields. And in that way, it will protect, protect the structure inside from the magnetic fields. And this is what the, 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 the 3D printing has been enabling. It has been enabling us the use of a complex magnetic material, also enabling us to perform complex designs, combine that with softwares like Comsol to be able to understand how a change in the design, if you make it with hollow structures or hollow features, how that may affect the internal structure and how it will affect the ability to shield. And this is in comparison with just a simple cylinder. So on the right-hand side, you can see just a simple magnetic shield. And then on the left-hand side, you find a more complex magnetic shield with complex walls inside that is 3D printed. And that actually gives a more efficient and more uh, effective way of shielding and protecting against the magnetic fields. The, the process itself, I mean, this is a, just a graphical abstract showing how the process works. Of course, the process itself, there is a magnetic material involved, of course, but at the same time, if you want that magnetic material that is 3D printed to function, you want that printed structure to have very low defects, don't want porosity. You want the grain structure or the crystal structure to, to if you have any material scientist among you, you want the grain structure to be large. You want the material to have low dislocation density. You don't want to have any oxides. And at the same time, you want to design a certain magnetic anisotropy. And at the same time, to have a low corrosivity, which is the resistance to magnetic field flow. And that's what we have done. Basically, we looked into how we can design this. And one of the tools we have been playing with is our ability to align the crystal structure through building the component at different angles. So magnetic fields typically they have, or magnetic fields, they prefer to propagate in certain crystallographic planes because they are what we call them the easy access for, for material, uh, for, for magnetization. And this is what we have done. We tried to tailor the design to allow us to get the magnetic fields to propagate in a certain direction. And then follow that with a lot of treatments, a lot of mechanical properties, a lot of um, optimization of the microstructure. As you can see, it looks very fine grain structure. After heat treatments and after uh, improvement of the mechanical properties, you can see the grain size is much larger, more equiaxed, more twins inside. And that enables us to generate a significantly lower or a lower um, corrosivity level. So the material becomes able to attract the magnetic fields. And a significant jump in properties after printing. So that's the first uh, application, the idea of printing shielding solutions for quantum sensors. The second application which we are currently working on is the idea of working on smart magnetic materials. Smart magnetic materials, they essentially, if you apply a magnetic field into 
the material and that will result in the material actually gaining an extra length and that's because of the crystal structure inside will change from a certain type of what we call martensite into another type of martensite and when that change happens the the height of the material will change that effect it can be reversed through heating to a, to a phase called the austenite and then cooling to return back to that parent martensite that cycle of the 4d or 4d printing is basically giving us a shape that can grow and become small and that's made out of an alloy of nickel manganese gallium so this magnetic memory effects occur, occurs in the martensitic phase by the tuning effect the, essentially the crystal structure will reorient itself the shape will modify itself until we get into the, the different phase and, and that's simply by through the application of magnetic fields and heating and cooling this work we've been still in progress still it's still early days but we've been able to print for the first time some of these nickel manganese gallium parts been able to print blocks and small thin lattices out of it and slightly bigger lattices as you can see these are the different shapes at the moment we're looking into how we can maximize their uh, res magnetic, magnetic responsiveness by improving their microstructure and giving them a heat treatment to be able to respond and move. So there is not yet, I'm not going to show you much pictures showing things that are moving, but stay tuned, something is going to be uh, available around this in, uh, in a matter of maybe a few months. One other material I've been printing, which is also another magnetic material, is mag magnetocaloric materials, or basically materials for the magnetocaloric effect. MCEs, and this is a special alloy called the lanthanum ion silicon alloy. The concept of magnetic heat exchanger is a, is a new concept relatively, and it's becoming quite important nowadays when we talk about cooling for things like vaccines, where you want to maintain temperatures for a long time. You cannot use typically conventional fridges to do that. Conventional fridges use gas compression systems, so they use ferion, for instance, and we know their problems. They have problems with emissions, problem with their uh, energy uh, efficiency. And so the magnetocaloric effect came as a process which is with, oh, this is a material where if you apply a magnetic field into it, it's going to change in temperature when the magnetic field is added or removed. So in the case of uh, uh, the, this material, this is for instance, in the case of a, a cycle, if you magnet, magnetize it, the material will cool down and, as a, and then it's gonna get the heat again from the fridge and then transform once again. So an entire fridge cycle became composed of a magnet where you apply into that, a magnet where you apply a magnetic field into this material, the lanthanum ion silicon material. And, and also that will also have water as the cooling medium inside. So in this case, you completely avoid the need for ferrons to be involved. It's just based on simple magnetization, demagnetization, where you get the heat in, heat out. Now. The, one of the benefits of using something like 3D printing is the ability to print shapes like the ones you see in front of you. You print high surface area to volume shapes. So shape you see in front of you has uh, a lot of lattices and you can see when you cut it inside, it's not just a simple channels. There are some network of complex structures inside. So when you create high surface area, you even increase the temperature or the heat transfer efficiency, in fact, by, by doing so. So some... This work is, is some of the things we've been looking into. So you can see this is the material. Unfortunately, the material being used is a very brittle material. So the powder, as you can see, looks rather ugly compared with other metallic powders that are made by gas atomization. It's a little bit brittle looking, uh, faceted in shapes. Uh, and that is one of the problems we have with it. But when you start printing using this material, also material itself is very brittle. So you end up generating a lot of cracks. Now, cracks, in this case, you want to think about it. Do you need them? Do you, do you, are you worried about them or not? I mean, in a sense, you would like to avoid the cracks as much as you can, because that is likely to lead to deterioration of the quality of the, of the part that you're making. But at the same time, the, the, having the, the cracks may not be the end of the world anyway. So some of the work we've been doing, we've been looking into how we can reduce the cracking, printing complex shapes with complex channels inside, to allow us to generate a much improved heat transfer efficiency and also uh, use the heat treatments to try to maximize the response of these materials 
um, to the the um, um, to the magnetic uh, field when they applied on it. There are some very good news. So, on the on the literature in the literature, um, the one of the very few papers published on this field looked into <clears throat> printed uh, 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 lanthanum ion silicon alloys. And what they measure is the delta S, which is the change in entropy change. And so you want basically that entropy change to be as maximum as possible based on the magnetic field you apply for. So here the magnetic field is around 1.9 Tesla. So this is how much magnetic field you apply into it and how much entropy change. And you can see at which temperature do we get that change in entropy. In the material we have been printing, we have also been able to generate the same or similar temperature range, but more importantly, we've been able to get a much higher entropy change for a much lesser magnetic field. So here we're using one Tesla only, that blue triangle is only at one Tesla and we're getting a much more stronger delta S uh, entropy change. And, and that basically shows that this work actually is, uh, is, has the great potential of allowing us to use these materials with a, with a very good uh, magnetic resp response to the, to the magnetic field being applied, re resolving some of the issues related to cracking susceptibility and allowing us to print a structure with less cracks or as, as a, in a way, cracks that do not compromise the performance, then that is going to give us the chance to, to generate those structures in a much better way. So I finished by this talking about magnetic materials just in snapshots. I'll move now into talking about uh, smart materials. Smart materials, are the material that has been of interest to us has been the nickel titanium alloy. Nickel titanium is, for those of you who don't know about nickel titanium, is a material that has different levels of performance. It has, could have something called super elasticity, which is typically used in dental wires. This is a material that if you apply the formation into it, it goes back to its original shape. I hope the animation is working fine. Um, essentially, this is caused by a strain-induced transformation. So the crystal structure will change by the deformation when you the transformation is gone. And that gives us a lot of recoverable strain on the material when you apply a load into it. There is also the shape memory effect, which is a material that you can deform at low temperature. So you'll see here the lady now deforming it. And then once it deformed, you put it in the hot water, and then it goes back to its original shape. When you deform the material in the low temperature field in the martensite, you can recover it by taking it into the high temperature and that will take it back to its original shape. This is an example of a material that is used in, in a wide range of applications uh, by, you, by capitalizing on harnessing. This can be even be more complex into what we call a two-way shape memory effect where the material will change between two shapes, a low temperature, and high temperature shape by temperature. So based on a process called training. So what you see in front of you here, this is a lamp. And as you switch on the lamp and the heat from the light bulb starts to spread, the petals of the lamp will open. And as you switch it off, the petals will go back again. So that's done through an effect called training, which involves doing a lot of heat treatments to get the material to do that response when a temperature is applied into it. I will focus more in the talk about the, the, the first type, the super elasticity, because that is the scope for used a lot in, 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 in stents. So we have a project running at the moment on 3D printing of stents. As you all know, when we get old, we start to have stenosis in our hearts and typically by all the unhealthy food we've been eating, smoking and so on. So the, the cardiologist would typically interfere by putting three or four different stents in the, in the artery, like those ones. So the idea we came up with was, why don't we try to print the actual stent actually, and then make it customized to the, to the actual stenosis shape. And so this is a printed stent, for instance, one of the examples we looked into, we've done a lot of testing on it, especially also testing in a cell that simulates blood flow. I'll talk about it in, in, in more details in, in a minute. So, the good thing is that when you try to print those stents, you can print them and from inside, they look perfectly clean. This is the internal microstructure of the structure of the, of the stent. This is the 30 micron, so you can hardly see much defects. I don't know if you have good eyesight, you might be able to see a black spot there 
and a black spot there, that's probably less than one micron porosity, very small porosity. The major problem, however, was in the surface finish. And you can see here the surface is very rough. And that's because of the way that the process works. You, if you try to build a shape like that zigzag stent, you end up having, first of all, certain parts will start to be joined up. So this, this can be a problem. So in some stents, if you have parts like these, these are not joined up. The problem is when you build it in 3D printing, those of you who know about 3D printing, these parts will end up joining up because there is no support. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, if you apply uh, um, the, uh, uh, the the surface finish of these shapes, as you can see, is very is very is very rough. If you try different geometries, some other geometries are much more uniform. So you can see this one is straight. You, you don't have the same roughness in this in the in the features, and uh, you still have some partially melted particles inside the surface, but they're not as bad as the what you see in the zigzag stents. One other problem that we have seen is that when you try to print those materials, the material gets a problem related to the evaporation of nickel. So if you want the part to have that flexibility, this temperature here, which is the austenized finish temperature, this one has to move all the way to either to lower than the human body temperature. So they have to move probably around here. And this is a major problem, really, if you, if you don't have the ability to, to get this the austenite at low temperature. And so this was compromised by adding more nickel is basically we add more nickel and and through adding more nickel and through doing computer simulation we were able to know how much nickel is selectively evaporated from the chamber and we can add an extra amount of nickel to compensate for the nickel loss based on the process parameters we use so that was one problem that we saw and we managed to avoid by tailoring the chemistry to mitigate nickel loss because nickel can affect the performance of this material a lot. The third thing we, we looked into was how we can improve the surface finish. And one of the techniques we used was etching, chemical etching. So you can see this is how a printed stent looks like. And this is how it looks like after printing. And you can see the difference between the one that is as printed and, as, and, and uh, after finishing. So this one is after uh, etching. You can see much nicer and shinier. This is the one after etching. Unfortunately, the zigzag stent after etching, you do not solve the problem related to the sharp features and the regularity. And that's because of the way that 3D printing works. 3D printing operates something called the zigzag effect, where with every layer, you move a slight distance to the X and Y. And that basically makes it very difficult to clean a structure which is tilted at an angle. So we came up with a new approach as we were working uh, one of our partners said, why don't we try, instead of printing a stent, why don't we try to print a nitinol tube? The manufacturing of stents typically starts from making a tube. That tube to be made, you have to make an ingot, and that ingot has to see a lot of heat treatments, and then you have to drill a hole through the ingot, and then after that you have to do multiple steps of tube drawing until you reach the final stage. So what we suggested was, why don't we try to print the tube and then straight away from the tube, you go into doing laser micro machining. So use laser cutting to, to cut straight away the, the tubes. And this was the idea. So we print, a, we can print a customized tube and then you can use laser micro machining. So we are working in this case in a hybrid fashion. We're doing additive and then using laser micro cutting to cut nice clean struts like the ones you see in front of you. And the outcome was sometimes when, when you combine it also with the process like etching, you can generate a much cleaner surfaces and you can also get, this is the one I need to show you, a much better performance. So this is now after etching and after cleaning it. So you can see how now the stent is behaving. Um, it's very flexible, bendy and squeezy. So that can be crimped and then put inside the human body and then it can do the same job. And the surface finish after chemical etching the final chemical etching becomes much nicer. Stents, this, is in, this came as a parallel thing for our work on printing stents. Stents do have a problem related to their visibility. Stents in, in the body, they are very small. So doctors will spend a long time trying to find them and see where they are. So printing here has another potential benefit that I'm gonna mention in a second. Boston Scientific, for instance, they have been making stents 
and they've been adding a lot of platinum into them to enable us being able to see the stents and um, and find where they are much clearly uh, when we do x-ray imaging and adding a material like platinum or palladium into the stents it's not just improving the the the, the visibility by increasing its x-ray absorption also it's going to improve its biocompatibility and corrosion resistance because these are in a sense precious metals that are meant to to improve that performance so what we did was during printing we started to add materials like palladium and platinum into the powder so this is nitinol powder and the blue particles you see there are all the platinum you start to add so when you add that platinum inside and you cook it well you end up generating a structure which has a much higher uh, intensity so the one on the left hand side is a stent where you during printing you added platinum platinum palladium as a marker material into it and this is the one without pl uh, pl palladium and you can see here on the gray scale the one which has palladium has a much more absorption so on the on the x-ray is actually much able to suck more over and above the benefits of doing it by uh, doing by, by actually printing printing the part uh in in that way i'm still on 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 smart materials and on on 4d printing and in this case i'm going to move from stents into something else this is into structures which are called the oxetic structures which is a so-called negative Poisson ratio material this is a material that if you apply a load into it it becomes short and small in diameter so as opposed to the normal material where if you apply a load into it, it actually opens up. It's the opposite. If you have an oxetic material, it, if you apply a load into it, it actually moves inside. And probably the easiest way to, to imagine it is when you look into the stents in, in the next slides. These are how they look like, those oxetic structures. They look like lattices, but they have that ability to densify. Actually, if you apply load into them, they become small and thin. So that's an example of an oxetic structure. Let me show you this animation. So if you apply a load into it, it becomes short and the diameter becomes thin. So most metallic materials have a positive Poisson's ratio. You know Poisson's ratio, right? So um, whereas in the case of the elastic modulus, uh, uh, sorry, in the case of the negative Poisson ratio structures, you make a negative Poisson ratio structure, not the material. The material itself still has the positive Poisson ratio, but it's the structure itself that behaves in such a way. And in many references, people have come up with designs like these that can be used to make um, negative Poisson ratio structures. There are it's like more designs and more unit cells of different abilities that you can have and for different applications. We have looked into it for one key application, which is essentially we wanted to see if we can use it for low, as a load bearing structure. And one of the tools we have on Earth is our ability to control the uh, Poisson's ratio. So imagine if you have this unit cell for an oxetic shape, and that unit cell, if you design that angle, this angle here, based on the angle that you put, you can get the Poisson ratio to change. So if you go to Poisson ratio of 75, sorry, uh, an angle of 75 degree, your Poisson ratio is gonna go up to, to well, almost 1.75, okay? The second factor you can change is the amount of material inside the unit cell. So inside one unit, of this oxetic shape. So imagine this shape. So this is one unit, like one unit of it. So within one unit of the of the structure, you basically can generate the amount of, you can control the amount of material, the density of the material. And again, as you change the density, you can generate different levels of Poisson's ratio in the structure. And that's basically what we try to do. We try to look into how we can get the structure, first of all, to have a low Poisson's ratio, while at the same time, having it to be printable. Those of you who know about 3D printing will have heard the expression support structure. So the structure needs to have a little bit of support to allow us to build in, in 3D, like in this shape. And, and effectively the structure was built uh, by slight modifications, still achieving a very high Poisson, negative Poisson ratio. And more importantly, the mechanical properties of it were very good. The trick that you made, this structure out of nitinol, out of titanium nickel alloy. And this titanium nickel, the idea was that as we compress it by loading, we can go back and give it some heat so it will go back to its original shape. 
So that's the idea of the reversible oxytic shape. So the, the work is in full is published in Actum, Trialia. It actually looks into how we can make a shape that can be compressed. And then after you compress it, you heat up, and then you can go back to its original shape. We've done, we were able to get very good or very low or relatively good Poisson ratio. And the structure was able to sustain the loads applied into it with no cracks applied into it. This is probably the last example I'm going to talk about today. So this is about, again, smart structure applied in a medical implant. We all, you know, at some point people, you might have heard about someone who had a hip implant, hip implant or a knee implant, or they had some sort of a bone replacement or plates or so. Bone cells in general, they have a variable varying structure. So from the inside, they are, have a low density. From the outside, they have a high density structure. So what we try to do in this project, we try to look into printing them out of also out of nitinol, the super elastic material I showed you at the beginning. And the aim is that we generated a functionally graded lattice. So when we print those lattice shapes that can be printed by 3D printing, we generated a structure that is, um, has a lot of porosity inside and less porosity on the outside. So on the inside, the porosity were big like that one, and on, 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 sorry, on the outside and inside the unit cells, that unit cell was much smaller. And we made it out of a very special material, the smart material, because that, is very similar in its performance to the bone. So, so essentially, you can go and you can build lattices like these ones with uniform lattices, uniform unit cells. But one thing we have done, which is to build the lattice actually with a varying unit cell. So you can see here that you have smaller pores on the outside, bigger pores on the inside. And as I said, this was made out of that flexible material to allow us to give it some ability to expand and, and, and behave in a nice way, like, a, like bones exactly. To measure the properties, we use the technique called digital image correlation, where you apply, um, use, use basically a camera to measure and monitor the change in strain behavior during loading. Um, and the, the process is itself, it tracks individual pixels of the sample surface to be able to generate a three-dimensional uh, deformation map for the sample as it is def deforming. So these different shapes, we looked into testing the uniform lattice. So this is a uniform lattice, just the same shape all the way by image correlation. And what you can see is that the structure will densify as you apply a load, the compression load into it. It will densify at a 45 degree band, as you can see. And that's common. Those of you who studied you know, uh, cubic materials will know that about the 45 degrees and how the material will shear at 45 degrees and things like that. So this is common and expected. Whereas in the case of a graded lattice, we found something completely different. The material was actually densifying to the inside. It was behaving exactly like how a foam-like material would compress if you try to squash it in your hand. The load was getting things to move from the outside to the inside, giving higher compressive loads in the middle. And that's in a way similar to how bones will behave. Bones will not behave as a, should not behave as a, as this shape and will not behave in, should behave in something like that. This is their characteristic, in fact. More importantly, by tailoring the porosity and tailoring the design, we are able to achieve very low elastic modulus. Some of it can be around one gigapascal and going to up to 4.5 gigapascal. The aim of having a metallic material of such a low modulus is that you are getting a structure which is very strong, but still it can, it's very similar to the human bones in its ability to, to take and sustain initial loads as the load is being applied. Okay. So I come now to the conclusion and more importantly, I want to talk about opportunities. So uh, hopefully this can be an opportunity for, for us to be able to do some work and some collaborative activities with the, with the Nile University and, and other universities as well. So we are doing 3D printing as you know, and our machines are running 24 seven. So, if you are interested in any of the work that we're doing, we can always build on extra samples from the materials we use. Uh, this has been, I've done a lot of previous work with other universities in Egypt and other places through this collaboration. So if there is something that we can do together, please get in touch. We can make the samples interesting by making them porous. We can make them made out of functional materials or so. Our current activities are expanding. So there's, as you saw, the work on magnetocaloric materials, the work on permanent magnets, 
So trying to make magnets actually by 3D printing, um, the magnetic shape memory effect that I showed you today, the some of the quasi-crystalline materials to try to generate semi-amorphous type materials, uh, batteries and energy storage uh, for fuel cells and hydrogen storage. These are things we hope to start soon. Uh, catalysis, as I showed to you, and we always love to work on multidisciplinary problems. So if you have an idea for a project, please get in touch and be very, very happy to, to work with you all. And I take this as a chance to thank those who funded our activities in the past 10 years or so, which is summarized today. And I thank the people who did the work in, in what I presented today. And I hope I left enough time for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matez, for this very nice talk. Uh, I'm personally uh, uh, very interested in the dental applications you talked about, and uh, probably I'll have a discussion with you uh, because I have some ideas, and I'm very happy, of course, to uh, collaborate with you. This is not our first time together. Uh, I don't want to count the years. So <laughs> I, I, have, I, have known, I have known Dr. Irene for uh, 25 years, but <laughs> something like that. So I spent a long time. I spent a long time, yes. Uh, I have a question for you, but let me uh, first ask if any of our uh, attendees want to ask any question. Please. Uh, okay, let me uh, ask you. Uh, I've been uh, thinking a lot about uh, the additive manufacturing uh, uh, future in Egypt, and I think there are a lot of challenges that um, are maybe uh, making things not working very well. So could you tell us your experience? Because I know you've been uh, doing some work in Egypt. Could you tell us why there are some challenges in Egypt in the additive manufacturing field? Um, I think in the, in, the metal, in the metal arena, I think the main issue is the cost of the equipment. So a single uh, additive manufacturing platform nowadays is probably within the order of, um, if you want a, a good machine, it's around half a million dollars, for instance. You can buy good ones for, let's say, $100,000, which is, which is not too bad, I hope. It's still a lot of money, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not too bad. You can get just one like this. The other problem really is the availability of the material that you're investigating. So if you come to say, I would like to work on smart material, I mean, even us in Europe, to get to work on a new material, it takes a lot of development time to source and find that new material. And essentially that is not available in Egypt. Um, always, as I know that there's been difficulties in importing um, chemicals or importing um, some of the materials that are used in, in, in research. So um, that may cause some barriers towards wider application or wider investigation of, the, of these materials by research or by the industry. Polymers is doing well. On polymers printing, there are machines. People are now in Egypt are very skilled that they can build their own machines. They can make their, uh, um, they can also make filaments in Egypt. Um, and I've seen very interesting work happening on the polymers front. But on the metal front or the ceramic front, I think it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's tricky. Even the, the, the current, there is an Egyptian company that works on making their own printers. And uh, the problem is that they moved to uh, make their machines abroad, uh, overseas, because it's easier from a supply chain perspective. I think Egypt needs a national strategy, really, to, to consider this technology, because it's, a, it's about time, really, that we, we work on this. And uh, as you know, during my visit in Egypt the, this period, I'm hoping to talk to this about this with the government to see if we can find a way to put a strategy to promote research in this field. Uh, I think you summarized it all. Thank you very much for uh, this interesting talk. And um, uh, let's have uh, a break five minutes and then we will be uh, uh, continuing with our next uh, keynote speaker. Thank you so thank, much. Thank Dr. you very Martin. much, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.